the Town of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board meeting for December 19th, 2017. First item of business is approval of minutes from last month. Any errors, omissions, changes, comments? Make a motion. We accept the minutes from last month. Can okay, I have a motion? Second. Okay. <laughs> Pick one. <laughs> motion that's been seconded. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right. First order of business is the Balin Morris uh, Resource Protection Permit. Ronald Balin and Patricia Morris are requesting an, an after the fact resource protection permit to alter 1,557 square feet of RP2 wetland for drainage and lawn area located at 26 Hennepin Cove Road, section 19-8-3 resource protection permit public hearing. So it's going to have um, their representative do a an intro of the project, and then we'll open it up for public comment. Good evening, Chair Jordan, and members of the board. I'm Bob McTaff with Mitchell Associates, and I'm here representing Ron Balin and Patty Morris on this application. Um, first off, I'd like to say that uh, we have the site walk. The comments that were received by the town planner and the town engineer would have been due on Friday before we had the site walk, so we determined that it probably didn't make sense until we had the site walk with the board to see if there were other issues that needed to be resolved uh, with the revised plan. So those plans have been updated and have been submitted. I can answer some of the questions uh, that were raised during the site walk as well as a couple of the comments that were made by Mr. Hardy in his review letter as well. Essentially what this is is a, an after the fact wetland, RP2 wetland permit request. Uh, Morris, uh, Ron and Patty bought this house uh, from a prior owner who built the home uh, in 1998-1999 and it impacted the designated RP2 wetlands uh, uh, with fill for the house as well as for some of the backyard. It subsequently installed a, an underdrain uh, running through the backyard. It's the underdrain that the applicant is looking to replace because the underdrain had failed and at the time when they had solicited someone, solicited someone to repair, repair the pipe, uh, they were told that it needed to have a permit. So that's why they were before the board with that uh, request. Uh, Albert Frick Associates had done the wetland delineation for the prior owner before the house was built and we retained uh, Albert Frick again to go back out and to determine where the limits of the RP2 wetland uh, occurred on the site and they were able to go back out and they did some test pits to determine what the upper limit of what is the filled portion closest to the house it look, kind of looks in a kind of an orangish color along this side on the aerial is the 1,557 square feet of filled uh, wetland. And then to the lower side along this edge of here is RP2 wetland is a combination of the mown lawn as well as the vegetation that you saw when we were out on the sidewalk. Uh, Al, when he did his uh, delineation, basically the soils and hydrology in the lawn area itself where the underdrain runs through beats the classification in terms of determining this was also an RP2 wetland. Uh, these were some of the photographs uh, that we had submitted earlier uh, showing the, the backyard. Uh, this is looking from the westerly side uh, across the the edge, and it's difficult in this photograph here, it's uh, dark on the image, but this is roughly the edge of where the herbaceous and some mixed uh, shrub vegetation in the wetland occurs. The majority of it coming down is a uh, herbaceous cover. Uh, the pipe runs down along this side to the right of the hot tub. The lower image is part of that underdrain pipe that is a fabric. The best way I've described it on the sidewalk is it looks like a a dryer vent that's wrapped in a fabric and that is completely failed and full of material. And these are just a couple of the other images looking across the back here, uh, showing what the vegetation conditions are like. Uh, on this image, to try and make it a little bit clearer, and you'll see this in your subsequent package that I've submitted to me, <coughs> try to make it a little clearer, to show where the delineation edge of the wetland is that was actually field-determined uh, by Albert Frick. Uh, 
basically the delineation was between the fence section here and the fence section here where the under drain would be replaced. The wetland on either side is taken from the town's GIS uh, RP2 uh, wetland uh, mapping that you have. Uh, the, it's a little bit clearer in terms of the gradation in here. This is the filled area. This was a paver patio that was in existence uh, when the home was purchased. Uh, the applicants did put the hot tub on uh, the location where the existing prior pavers were. Uh, during the site walk, there was a question raised. There were some existing natural stone stepping stones, if you will, cutting across that go up to the upland area on this side, and we've shown those on the plan. The test pits uh, were on the plan, and Mr. Harding asked whether they were revised our plan to designate that they were done by Alan Frick's office. So essentially, the two plans almost look the same. What this one is, it's showing where the pipe is going to be installed uh, based on uh, Mr. Harding's comments about increasing the size of the pipe. We're going to increase the size of the pipe to an 8-inch line. It will still be installed in the same location, uh, in the same methodology, which will be a geotextile fabric and a stone blanket uh, for the pipe, and then a, a sand layer over the top of that, so it will allow the vegetation to, to continue to grow, and still allow the infiltration and runoff to go in. Uh, one of the questions during the sidewalk concerning the stepping stones is whether or not those could be removed, and those will be removed if you take it off the plan. Uh, a couple of questions raised by the board. One was whether or not the fence that exists around this is a combination of chain link fence, a, uh, a wire mesh fence that goes along the back, and there's an ornamental fence across the front. Those sections of fence were in place when the home was purchased. Uh, another question was whether or not the deck on the side of the house uh, was there when they purchased the house, and that was there. It's a set of French doors that actually lead out onto that. Uh, that deck was there when they purchased the home. Uh, regarding your question about the hot tub, and there is a letter that is a, will be in the packet that we received that we submitted uh, from uh, Ron and Patty, that when they put in the hot tub, they had spoken with the code office at the time, was their understanding from their discussion. They, they did not need a permit to put the hot tub where they located the dog, where the paper patio is. So, and that was one of the questions you folks had asked. Uh, Maureen raised the question about additional landscaping. I'm going to show this in the regard. Uh, one of the things in the discuss is whether or not they can actually take some of the invasive material that's planted in the wetland and actually plants some wetland, uh, native wetland plant material in there to enhance it, which also will improve the character of the wetland. There is an area on the upside of the RP2 wetland up in this area here, which is kind of open. It's up one area. We also like the opportunity to possibly do some landscaping up in there. There are no immediate plans for it, but when the question was raised, they'd like to be able to preserve the right for that and the discussion for the to, to deliberate on. I think those were the questions from the sidewalk. Uh, one of the comments uh, in Mr. Harding's letter was in regards to permitting. Uh, at the last meeting, I uh, presented you with a letter from uh, Bob Green from DEP regarding whether or not a DEP permit would be, excuse me, would be required for this application. And in that letter of response that you had from last time, uh, Bob Green indicated that it would not require a permit because there's no additional impact being done. It's a replacement of the pipe in the area to be restored. Uh, also, uh, with the Army Corps uh, would require a permit, and I spoke with Jay Clement from the Army Corps and explained when the work was, the activity was done so we could determine what the Army Corps permit process would have been at that time. In between 1998 and, 19, and 2002, the main general programmatic permit, uh, this level of impact would not have required even any notification of the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, so Jay did research in terms of what permits were in place at the time. And I sent him a copy of the sketch of the plan, so we knew what we were looking at. And as long as there's no further Im impact of the wetlands from what currently exists, then we would not have to go through any notification mm -hmm. from the Army Corps for this. And that pretty much, I think, covers most of the issues and an overview of what the, the process is uh, being proposed. Thank you. 
right, at this time I'm going to open this for a public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to speak on this submission? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing period and open it up to the board for questions. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so I guess my question is, if nothing is done, uh, let me rephrase that. If this is done, do you think that will improve the wetland or simply stop the degradation of, or undermining of the uh, existing foundation? I think it will help to t clean up the, the watershed that's going down. You can see where the debris was built up on the lower end. This will allow the flow to continue on through. So I think it will be an enhancement. And part of the upgrade for that pipe will be putting on a trash rack basically on the up, upstream end to prevent debris and sediment from getting down inside to deflect itself. And going with a larger pipe, if it ever needs to be flushed out, it's a large enough capacity that can handle being able to be cleaned up. So, Go ahead, Henry. I guess I have a question. How long before the pipe gets silted up? Well, given the size of the pipe we're going with, we shouldn't have the same issues that the four inch pipe has. It will have the ability to get the flow going through. And I wouldn't expect with the trash rack, and then we're doing the stone apron on the up inlet side and on the outlet side to keep the sediment built up from working into the pipe. Thank you. Anybody else? John? Yeah, and I. You may have said this, but are they intending to move the kennel <coughs> from the back of the house? I did not ask that question. I could ask. What was the question again? They are moving the kennel from in back of oh. the house. I mean, we haven't really talked about it. Um, sorry. Um, I mean, we can. Um, I'm not, we hadn't talked about it, so it's not like a permanent structure, but we're happy to do whatever helps. Could I have your name, so. please? What? Could I have your name? I'm sorry, Patty Morris. Yeah. And Ron Bailin. <clears throat> so, I mean, what, should, is this a time to ask what the, you want to talk about that? Um, so, because we weren't there, was there a particular um, discussion about that, or is there something that <laughs> does it have? You know, I'm just not really clear on whether there's an impact or not. I'm not arguing whether there is or there isn't, but I do like to have a cover over my dogs when it's raining. But um, you know, as I recall, we looked at it and realized that it would be it was not a permanent structure and would be very easy to move. I don't. We haven't really discussed whether we want it moved or not. Go ahead. Yeah, the same question on the hot tub. Uh, are you asking that it stay where it is? Because we had also discussed about moving that out of the RP2 district uh, area, I mean, up into the uh, upper por portion of the property where it was drier. Is that something you'd consider? Um, I mean, we we just have to get rid of the hot tub, frankly, because that's all the front of the property is all uh, like septic and leach field. Um, so, and, we, and, and without any uh, privacy to make use of it, so we would we, uh, yeah, the uh, I, I think we'd be more than uh, willing, if need be, to get rid of the uh, dog kennel. Uh, you know, for us to make use of the, the hot tub and have a, a, another reasonable location, I think it, our feeling is that uh, we, we likely would either, we, we'd ask to be able to keep it uh, where it is, and uh, you know, if not, we would consider removing it. And, and, you know, one of the considerations for me is not like, you know, we, we can't get rid of it, but um, it was a substantial expense. Um, and it would be very expensive to move. So I just don't think it'll be worth, I don't know that we practically can move it and I don't see, you know, where. So, um, and I'm not thrilled with the idea of more expense to tear it up, but whatever we've got to do. So just let us know. Any other questions? Go ahead. 
Well, it's not so much a question because the applicant just answered the question, but um, I do want to help them with the stability of their building. Um, I can see why this project needs to go forward, but I am concerned about um, the hot tub remaining there and as far as the, uh, the uh, freestanding dog pen, um, I do see where the fence does come up into an area that is out of the way of the wetland. Um, yeah, I have concerns about the hot tub and I wasn't sure if others had those concerns too, but I do want to do what I can do to help with the building. But I do have other concerns about what remains back in the um, wetland that should not be there. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not concerned with uh, the dog kennel or the, the hot tub. Um, it's there. And you let your dog run in the backyard, whether they're in the kennel or not. So, what's the difference? I guess I'm not concerned. Anybody else? For for what it's worth, I echo Jim on that. I'm not concerned with it either. I'm not. Okay. Um. Any other any other questions? Any other? Anything else? Now, we did not receive the plans or the information until yesterday, so they have not been reviewed by staff or by the uh, town engineer as of yet. So, um, I have a motion to okay. table. Yeah. Uh, motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Ronald Balin and Patricia Morris for an after the fact resource protection permit for 1,557 square feet of fill in an RP2 wetland for landscaping and an additional 275 square feet of temporary alteration to replace drainage pipe located at 26 Hannaford Road, Cove Road be tabled to the regular January 16, 2018 meeting of the planning board. Second. Second. Any discussion? Any further discussion? Right. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. We're good. Thank you. Next item on the agenda. I will turn over to my esteemed colleague. I will be recusing myself from the executive session and the item which follows. Okay, next item on the agenda, um, executive session. The planning board may vote to go into executive session to receive legal advice from the town attorney regarding the tower and antenna performance standards, section 19-8-12. Yeah, if you want. So okay. this is on the agenda. I believe the board asked to have the opportunity to go into executive session. Uh, the town attorney is in the audience and is available to join you in executive session if you want to do that. You do need to make a motion, and I would just follow the wording that's on your agenda because you have to go into executive session for a specific purpose. Um, so before we do that, can you give us, or John, give us a, just a brief uh, summary of why we would or would not go into executive session uh, the item in front of you for tonight on the agenda is specifically to go into executive session to receive legal advice regarding the tower and antenna performance standards so this is an opportunity for you to get private advice on your legal duties and responsibilities there would be no decision made during the executive session um, if you make a motion to go into executive session, you would then leave the room, we would go upstairs to the conference room. Uh, when you're done, we would return to this room, you would vote to get out of executive session, and then you would move on to the next item in the agenda. So there would be no decision made at the executive session. Any votes have to be taken in front of the public. And do we need to go into executive 
uh, session in order to receive advice from the attorney? No. Okay, any other questions, Victoria? No, I'd like to make a motion. Is that okay? I'd like to make a motion the planning board uh, go into an executive session to receive legal advice from the town attorney regarding the tower and antenna performance standards section 19-8-12. Sorry. Sorry. Second. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. What do we go to? All right, so we will adjourn to the which room is the second floor. second floor conference room.
executive session and resume the normal session. Motion to end executive session and resume normal session. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. The next item on the agenda, number four, 19 Wells Road Telecommunications Tower. Global Signal Acquisitions 4 LLC Crown Castle is requesting site plan review, a resource protection permit, and shoreland zoning review to construct a 180 foot tall telecommunications tower to be constructed at 19 Wells Road, um, R5 30. Section 19-9, Site Plan Public Hearing. Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Permit Public Hearing. And Section 19-8-2, Shoreland Zoning Performance Standards. Um, so I will ask the applicant to uh, present any changes that have been made to the application. And uh, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and uh, town planner. Um, for the record, again, uh, Victor Manugian from McLean Middleton Professional Association. On behalf of Global Signal Acquisitions for LLC, um, Crown Castle, um, I'm going to do a brief intro, but before I do that, I'd, I'd like to invite Bill Bo Jordan up to say one quick uh, message to the um, board and the uh, um, town. And I'm pretty sure it will be quick. I'm Bill Jordan, uh, one of the owners of Jordan's Farm at 21 Wells Road. Uh, just, the, just the background is we were approached several years ago about considering the idea of host, hosting a cell tower on our property on the, on, the back, on the back property, which is ledge. It's all rock ledge high. Uh, and we considered it and ended negotiations and, uh, after a while. And, agreed it was a proper use and we could uh, gather a year-round income that could help preserve the farm for uh, the next generation or even the next two generations with, you know, a, enough to pay taxes and maybe a little extra than that to, to uh, help things go. And we don't have too many crops uh, this time of year, so it uh, gets pretty lean. Uh, so basically we, we agreed that uh, we, would, uh, we would do that. Uh, we've harvested the trees off that uh, a couple, three or four years ago. That's another 15 or 20 years. We may be able to do that again, but it, we don't really get a get much much value from that, considering uh, you know where we're located. And so that's what we'd just like you to ask you to uh, to consider it. Help us uh, keep going for future generations. Uh, we really, uh, several years ago, and this is way before that, we uh, we were approached by someone about developing up there, and we listened to them. We weren't excited about it. We didn't really want to do it, and we probably won't do it, but I'm not saying the next generation wouldn't, wouldn't be forced into doing that. But the thing about that is it's a one one-shot deal. You get a, you know, an influx of cash, and then it's, you know, then it's basically used up over a few years, but uh, with with a long-term lease, 50 years, we get a little bit every year, and it, it really would make a big difference. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to do a quick um, review of where we've been. Um, and the reason I want to do that is uh, because of what I've seen and heard both at the site walk at this property and a, um, the last uh, work session that this uh, board had. Um, uh, as you know, we filed this application for rezoning with the town council on January 31st of 2017. 
uh, March 13th, uh, this was referred to the, the town council and referred the matter to this board. Um, subsequent to that, um, we attended a work session on um, April 4th um, with the planning board. At that work session, uh, we were present and um, um, uh, Justin Strout was there uh, for uh, his proposal for what I'll call, as this board has called, um, Strout Tower um, 2. Um, during that presentation, my client talked about why we are um, in this situation and how that um, they've tried to negotiate with um, the Strouts um, and they weren't getting anywhere. Um, Subsequent to our presentation, um, Mr. Strout made his presentation and he stepped up and he said something to the effect of um, um, there are no negotiations with Crown Castle um, and I've told uh, them to take their tower and go. Um, and that's, I'm paraphrasing, but I was there and that's my recollection. Um, that's why we're here today. Um, on the next thing that happened is that on June 20th of this year, this board um, approved the rezoning uh, request for the new tower overlay district in a five to zero vote. Um, on July 10th, the town council voted to refer the zoning ordinance, the, um, the zoning amendment to the ordinance committee for review. And subsequently, July 11th, the ordinance committee voted uh, three to zero to send the tower overlay map amendment back to the town council for consideration. Um, subs subsequent to that, on August 14th, the town council voted to adopt the change in the zoning map. Um, at that time, we became on the same level with the uh, land ab abutting us owned by the Strout family. Um, so we're in a tower overlay district. Um, uh, the Jordans uh, have a right under that decision and vote to build a tower on the property. Um, obviously, what's left is um, how, where, what, and that site plan review um, with this board. Um, we then attended the um, September 5th workshop for our proposal, and we presented our proposed installation to this board at that workshop. Uh, what happened next was that on September, in September, um, uh, what the entity was called in the letter was CE Tower LLC, which is basically the um, successor and in interest to the Strouts Tower Company that initially entered the lease arrangements with Crown Castle and its predecessor. Um, but um, the Strout, um, um, uh, Mr. Strout uh, initiated the letter dated September 22nd, um, which um, was sent to my client. Um, again, that the CE Tower LLC was the successor and in interest to the uh, initial lessors, which were Doris Strout and Herbert Strout. And I'm just going to read the bottom line of that notice, and it says that CE Tower LLC hereby notifies Crown Castle that on June 17th, um, uh, it says 1999, uh, I'm sorry, that the June 17th, 1999 lease will not be renewed at the end of the current term and will terminate on June 16th of 2019. Um, so um, we moved on, we filed the current application that's before um, this board uh, and started with that process on um, November 21st. Um, um, we, we've seen a lot of papers flying back and forth um, from um, uh, professionals, uh, residents, uh, etc. Um, and what I, what I want to do point out is that um, it, it is a race um, to build a tower. Um, there's two competing uh, interests here. Um, but what I will submit is that my client has submitted to the town council as part of its application process for the rezoning um, letters of intent from Verizon Wireless and T-Mobile that have stated that um, uh, they are willing to um, stay with us and um, uh, uh, go with us if the uh, tower is approved. Um, they have also some communications via email with AT&T, um, which they uh, are still working on, uh, and that's a work in progress. They're also looking at other carriers uh, to come on this tower. 
Um, additionally, um, we uh, uh, got a commitment and uh, are offering space to the police department and fire department to put their antennas on this tower. And uh, as of today, um, the uh, continued interests exist from Verizon Wireless, T-Mobile, and obviously the police and fire um, to go on this tower. Um, so that's kind of the backdrop I wanted to do before I turned it over. Um, uh, I will tell you that, as I mentioned before, we have submitted some reports. I just want to highlight them. Um, uh, and our experts are here if there's any question. We submitted this traffic study that's in your package. Uh, we submitted the sound study. Um, we also submitted the light study, the FAA study, which determined um, no lighting is required, and an RF emission study um, to address any safety concerns uh, that you may have. Um, and those are all uh, in your package and everybody's here. And as um, uh, Mr. Chairman asked me at the beginning, um, I'm going to bring up uh, uh, um, Lucas to talk about the changes in the drawings and where we've gone. And I'll let him introduce himself and um, go on. Uh, Lucas Anthony, please. Good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Lucas Anthony. I'm an engineer with Goral Palmer in South Portland. I'm here tonight on behalf of the applicant to give this board an update on where we stand with the plans. Um, I'll really start from our site walk, which was on December 3rd, and um, kind of move on from there. So the week after December 3rd, we submitted revised plans along with some stormwater calculations and a letter describing some of the changes we made. Um, I believe that information is in the packet you have tonight. The um, revised information was given to the town's engineering consultant, Sebago Technics, and um, they drafted a letter dated December 13th, and I also believe that's part of your packet. That letter from, from the engineering consultant contained about contained 12 comments. Uh, when I look at that letter, I, I break those comments down into three, three kind of different distinct categories. Uh, first category being erosion control, both temporary erosion control during construction and then permanent following construction. Um, the other category is width of the road. There, as you recall, during the site walk and um, Prior to that, there was some discussion on the width of the road as it crosses the pond spillway, whether it's 12 or 14 feet. So there's some discussion in his letter about that. And then finally, um, permitting. In addition to the town permitting, there's also um, state and federal permitting that's required for this project. And that's mentioned in the, the uh, letter as well. Um, after receiving those comments from Sebago Technics last week, We've worked to revise the plans, and um, this morning we were able to meet with Steve at Sebago Technics and walk through the revised plans and comments. Um, we went through the, each comment one by one with the town's engineer and touched on each element and the revisions we made to the plans. Um, in general, we believe that the revisions made to the plans uh, will allow us to meet the conditions of approval that are before you in the memo tonight. Some, uh, some notes on the, on the letter. Um, one of the topics we discussed was width of the road. Um, earlier, we had requested that the width across the spillway be reduced to 12 feet. However, since then, the fire chief has visited the site, and he's, he's requested that it be 14 feet. Um, we're completely okay with that. The applicant is fine with 14 feet, and that's what our current plans show. Um, in addition to the 14 feet, the fire chief um, insisted that guardrail be installed. We've also complied with that and put guardrail on the plans. Um, and, even, and we made some additional changes to the guardrail design following uh, 
discussion with the town's engineer. Um, regarding permitting, uh, in the town engineer's letter, he noted that there may be additional permits required. Um, and the applicant has acknowledged that. We'll need a DEP permit for the road, um, the access way, and we'll also need an Army Corps of Engineers permit for that as well. Um, in Maureen's memo to you, that's one of the conditions of approval that we secure those permits prior to a building permit being issued. Um, the applicant is, is aware of that and willing to, uh, to pursue those permits. Um, so that's where we stand in summary with the plans and um, happy to answer any questions. Do we have any really quick questions before we go into the public? Yeah, I do. Okay. Victoria. Was there, was there anything in the engineer's letter that you don't believe you'll be complying with? No. Um, we don't. Okay, no more questions? Okay. Um, I'm going to open this up to the public hearing now. Uh, how many people here are planning to speak? Raise your hand. Okay, what would be very helpful is if you all stand up and move over to the windows so that we don't take much time um, getting to the podium. As always, you'll have three minutes to speak, and we have a timer going, so... Um, Please keep your comments to three minutes. Okay? First person. All right, so who would like to go first? Who would like to be at the front of the line? Good evening. My name is Nathaniel Bessie. I'm an attorney from Brandon Isaacson. I've been retained by a number of uh, residents of the Cross Hill neighborhood, a number of families there, to take a look at this application and uh, provide some comments to you. And we did submit written comments as well, which uh, I hope the planning board has received. The, uh, the issues that I would like to highlight, I think there are two, two key issues that I want the, the planning board to be aware of. The first is, um, the issue of co-location, which you recently discussed in executive session, it is the position of, of the neighbors. I think this is important for the town to, to really take seriously the requirement and the, the intent of the zoning ordinance that there be no more, no more new tower construction than is necessary. So uh, Mr. Mnuchin said that the, the tower overlay district provides the, a right to build a tower. It does subject to the tower performance standards, and those include a co-location requirement that uh, an applicant demonstrate that there is a need for a tower and uh, that there, you know, that it's possible, that it's not possible to locate antennas on existing towers or approved towers. Uh, so I, I think that if this, if this is uh, approved, then what, we'll, what you'll be doing is saying that one tower is being taken down, the old Crown Castle Tower on 14th Strat Road, and it will be replaced with two towers. And before you make that approval, the the uh, planning board needs to be certain that there's evidence that two towers are necessary to replace one. Uh, I think another issue that is important to keep in mind is that the wetland issues are very significant here. We're talking about building an access road through uh, wetland in the RP1 zone, the critical wetland overlay zone and the shoreland zone. And in my review of the, of the record and the public file, I haven't seen any evidence that this is an existing road all the way through. Uh, there's a 2006 boundary survey that was provided by the applicant that shows that road terminating short of the site. And uh, so if that's not an existing road, then that's a prohibited use. And given the significant wetland issues, given the question of necessity, the planning board ought to, uh, at the very least, ask for additional, additional information about the road and the environmental issues prior to moving forward and approving and ask for more information about the necessity of having a second tower 
right next to another approved tower and another existing tower, as there isn't a 180-foot tower on the Strout property right now that will not be taken down. So that's my Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Barry Atwood. Uh, uh, unlike many of the people in the room, I am, I am not a resident of the Cape. However, I grew up here, and members of my family uh, more than six decades have lived in the town. I have many, many friends in the town. I consider it my hometown. Uh, and I stay in touch with the things that uh, are going on in the Cape. Um, I think there may be a lot of people who speak, and I, I don't think we should be repeating each other. However, uh, this issue to me uh, really has to do with your ordinance. And it's very, very clear to me that the intent of this ordinance is to prevent unnecessary towers. And the existing towers at the Strout site, uh, the existing, the remaining tower and the new tower that's been approved, there is plenty, plenty of opportunity for co-location, almost unlimited. Uh, because that's the nature of the tower. I know there's an issue with what's the best real estate and people pay more. That's kind of beside the point. The fact is the, the carriers are all happy to, to be on that tower. And there's room for fire and police and CMP and a lot of people on existing towers. And to me, this ordinance, what the intent of this ordinance was very, very clear. It doesn't say that it says to ensure, which means you should make it happen, um, the board may. So again, I can't advise the board as to what to do. Um, you have to make the decision. But a very, very, very careful reading of this ordinance and trying to understand the spirit of the, the crafting of this ordinance to prevent unnecessary towers. That's really what it comes down to. That's what it's all about. It's not about preserving farms. It's not about uh, the Stroud site's been there for generations. No, it's not about that to me. So I urge you, please, take a very, very careful look at the language of this ordinance to see what direction that should give you. Thanks. Excuse me, Mr. Atwood. Yes. Can you, can you state your address, please? Uh, I live in Gorham. Gorham. Yeah. So uh, 293 uh, North Gorham Road, Gorham, Maine. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Peter Carter, 21 Ocean House Road, Cape Elizabeth. I also served on this town's planning board for 10 years as a member and two years as an associate member and two years as chair. I was appointed by this board to be the planning board's nominee to the communications tower committee of which I served as chair. The first meeting we went to and the following meeting as well the only thing we discussed was what was our intent, what was our charge. And our charge was very simple. We didn't get into any great terms because of who was on that board. They were all local people. Maureen invited a lot of experts in as outside guests sometimes when we had questions. They were all locals, we were all the same. And our intent was to offer all the citizens of Cape Elizabeth reasonable cell phone coverage without having cell phone towers sat sprouting like milkweed plants throughout the town. And I believe we did that. And that's the way it's been for some time, for many decades. And to allow another cell phone tower to come into town 500 feet from existing towers, this doesn't make any sense and it violates the intent of that original committee. I mean, I can remember taking three meetings to discuss and debate with our fire chief the fact that he wanted to put a cell phone tower at the town transportation to be owned by the fire department to generate revenue for the fire department. And it took some convincing, but mainly for me, that I didn't feel it was fair for the town of Cape Elizabeth, especially its fire department, to be in competition with local business. And he finally conceded. I noticed in going through some papers at the town office today and the planning office that that's back on the front burner again. I don't know why. It was never our intent. 
when that committee brought that ordinance to the town council, there wasn't this many people there. It wasn't controversial because we followed and listened to the people of Cape Elizabeth, which when this room fills up like this, it's because you're not listening. And I just ask you to do that. Thank you. My name is Paul Strout, and I live 11 Timber Farm Way in Falmouth. Um, I grew up in Cape Elizabeth and still have many ties to the town. As owner of Tower Specialist, we have towers from Palmyra to Sanford and work with all the major cell carriers. When a cell carrier calls, they always ask where I would like to have the highest available spot on your tower. The reason for this is that it allows the best signal possible. <clears throat> of course, that's what they're looking for. A few months ago, the planning board approved our new 180-foot tower. This tower is built to handle five cell carriers, as well as many other communication uses. According to the town planner, the town has received countless public comments supporting better cell phone service as a public safety need. We agree. Let me tell you why I do not think that the 19 Wells Road Tower supports this goal. The purpose, the, <clears throat> the proposed tower is lower in elevation than both of our towers. And lower elevation is never better. Why would the planning board want to duplicate what is already in place when the coverage maps clearly show there is absolutely no improvement. With my 50 years in the tower business, I firmly believe that the town will end up with worse cell phone coverage. As the definition of tower's height is the distance measured from average original grade to the highest point on the tower <coughs> or other structure, even if said highest point is an antenna. The current application clearly shows a tower exceeding the ordinance height limit of 180 feet, and it's because of the antennas on the top. In summary, I would urge you to not approve the application before you tonight. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Steve Bradstreet with Ransom Consulting in Portland, Maine. Um, representing the Strouts. Um, there's a couple points that I'd like to uh, bring out. Uh, my letter, I believe, is in your file. It was uh, submitted today uh, with a number of comments in there, but there's a couple specific ones that I'd like to uh, uh, note. In the Town's Resource Protection Ordinance, uh, it states that no new roads are allowed. Reconstruction of existing roads would be accepted. However, if you look at the plans, the plans do refer to it in a couple of places as a trail. Uh, it has been referred to as a skid trail by the town. Um, just local knowledge of what it's been used for in 2012, 2013, that land was uh, timber harvested. And those primarily right now are uh, skidder trails. They are, if you go out there, I did not go out on the sidewalk. I wasn't uh, asked to at the time. They are not gravel roads. It is indicated that they are 8 to 12 feet wide uh, gravel drive or a gravel road in different locations on the plans. If you look at the uh, photographs, they are organic tire ruts with grass growing up in between and on the sides. Uh, the town's ordinance in, re in regards to what is a road, it refers to the street, the definition for a street. And the definition for the street is a paved gravel or exposed mineral soil surface, surface. and uh, mineral is defined as inorganic. And everything that I've seen out there on the photographs and discussions with people that have taken the site walk is that is a, it's definitely all organic. There's no gravel out there from the extension of the road within the um, RP zone up towards the tower. 
The second thing that I'd like to bring up is in regards to where it, uh, it separates the pond from the Strout property. Uh, the road, edge of road, according to the plans, is within four feet of the property line. They also propose in that location to raise the road by 12 inches, uh, according to the detail. Uh, raising the road there, uh, having the side slope coming down to the abutting property, I believe in a few instances would be crossing the property. Uh, they also discussed that in their detail that they're removing six inches of organic soil first before they put the gravel. Uh, right there, they're saying organic. It's not supposed to be organic. It's supposed to be gravel or mineral. Um, lastly, the uh, area on the plans in where the spillway is, they talk about a one to 10 slope. A one to 10 slope is a vertical, almost vertical. It is similar to the batter on a retaining wall. Um, and it, with that, they indicate that it would be... Please wrap it up. It would be rip-wrapped, and rip-wrap is not stable at that slope. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Justin Strout. Um, I represent the Strout Trust as abutters to the 19 Wells Road property. I just want to talk about a few things that uh, concern us. We have some issues with the uh, survey that was provided, the boundary survey. It still doesn't locate uh, anything that the applicant is describing. And when we went out on our site walk on December 3rd, um, I heard terms like approximately, about, near, close to, but I never heard anything that was a definite. And uh, I'm a little concerned about that because I don't want to have setback issues in the future. Um, the other thing that I'm concerned with is with the resource protection permit, I was reading through your ordinance and it talks about the uh, Conservation Commission reviewing things. And I haven't seen any comments from them. And I know they had that December 12th meeting, uh, was canceled due to weather. So I was trying to find out if they'd even reviewed anything at all. Basically, we, we talked about, Steve just talked about the road, and as far as I can tell, that road was built during the, uh, the skidders' travels when they did the timber harvesting. Everybody that I've talked to says that the road used to stop just around the corner of the pond, and from there it was walking paths. And uh, I just don't see that, that there's any evidence to the contrary. And, in fact, the 2006 boundary survey that was provided by the applicant reinforces that. It shows clearly that the tote road, as they call it, comes to an end within this, well within the RP1 buffer. And those are my major concerns. Thank you. Good evening, my name is David Jones. I've been a resident at 2 Algonquin Road in Cape Elizabeth for 37 years. I'm a civil engineer and I've been a construction manager for 50 years. I oppose the effort to increase the number of cell towers in Cape Elizabeth. <clears throat> I note that there are three current proposals for new cell towers in town, all located 500 feet of each other. I've read the tower and performance standards and it seems that the intent of the ordinance is being ignored. Specifically, the ordinance reads, to ensure co-location, the town may require co-location on a tower in order to prevent the need for commercial wireless telecommunication service providers to build new towers. <clears throat> the ordinance wants fewer cell towers, not more, and I think most residents agree with this approach. Once these towers are approved, how many more will follow? By approving all these towers, are you disregarding the ordinance and setting a precedent that will be regretted later? You recently approved the cell phone antennas added to the water tank in my neighborhood, which is Shore Acres. 
and that did not improve my coverage, contrary to what we were told. How is putting three more towers in the same area going to improve coverage for our cell phones? Will they want to put three towers by the water tank as well? Thank you for listening. My name is Nick Tamaro. I am the current president of the Cape Elizabeth Farm Alliance. I'm here to support the proposed tower at 19 Wells Road, Jordan's Farm. It is important that we allow farmers to be creative in generating revenue to help them stay sustainable. The tower project is a great way to generate revenue on a portion of land that is not tillable. Allowing the tower will help Jordan's Farm be sustainable for future generations. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Bill Bamford, 112 Sperlink Avenue. Uh, I am here in support of the Jordans uh, tonight. As uh, Bill Jordan said, this is a hard time of year to be growing things outside. Um, to the larger issue of, of all the details that need to be worked out, um, I've watched this board in action over a period of years now, and I know that that is something that uh, you are not going to ignore. You're going to uh, take care of the details, um, and I think um, political issues aside, uh, it's an opportunity for the Jordans uh, to uh, make a long-term investment in their farm, and I would encourage you to uh, support that. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to come forward and speak? Okay, seeing no one, the public hearing is now closed. So we have a bunch of questions here, and um, before we get the applicant back, um, maybe, uh, can I ask you a few of the questions? Sure. All right, so one of the items that came up a few times is the question of is it a road, and is it an existing road? Yes, so the question of whether it's an existing road goes to the resource protection standards because the pond is surrounded by a wetland and the applicant needs to take the existing road and expand it. But you're not allowed to build a new road in an RP1 buffer or an RP1 wetland. You are, however, under item number 22 in the table of uses in section 19-6-9, you're allowed to reconstruct an existing road. So the way this has been interpreted in the past is there's no limit on the amount of reconstruction. It's whatever the planning board reviews and approves. There's also nothing that says how little that has to be there. There just has to be something that actually looks like some kind of road as anyone might consider it. I did hear a member of the public testify that it was a road up to a certain point and then it was a walking trail. <coughs> Well, a walking trail could be considered some type of private road, especially when you think about farm roads that people put in the woods and they use to a certain extent. So there's nothing that says in the resource protection standards that this has to be a formalized type of road that has a recorded right-of-way of a minimum width those are the type of standards you will find in other sections of the ordinance. You'll find those standards under the private access way standards. You'll find them under the private road standards. But under the resource protection permit standards, it's a it's very, very low standard. And I can even give you the legislative history on the definition. And the definition came out of a lawsuit that was filed on the old Spurwink Woods development, where a property owner proposed to build a new road over a wetland and said that there was really an existing road there that no one could see. And that went to court and the developer lost that case. Uh, the town had since put in a description that talks about the mineralized bed. 
So it, it ought to be something that the average person, you can take out there and they'd say, oh yeah, I see that. Uh, as opposed to nothing that's in a wetland and you have to do core borings to see if it was ever built, which was suggested in the court case that the developer lost. So it's up to the board to decide if there's enough there that they can consider it an existing road. And, and I, I will stop here, but uh, let I've, me just ask I've been out there when we were reviewing other subdivisions and there was something there. Is the fact that it is not on the survey that was submitted germane in any way? I don't believe it is because there's nothing in the resource protection standards that requires that it actually have a deeded described right of way. And boundary surveys tend to deal with deeded rights. Uh, we don't require, when, when we get a boundary survey from any developer, we don't require that every single physical feature on the property be shown on the boundary survey. We talk about boundaries, uh, lot lines, easements, existing road, rights of way. Um, roads that don't have rights of way often are not shown, or the right of way is not shown because it doesn't exist. And that road, that road actually connected to what's Tiger Lily Lane now at one point? Yeah, the, the Cross Hill subdivision was originally approved as Dominicus Crossing. And when the Dominicus Crossing subdivision was laid out, uh, the intent was for Tiger Lily Lane to dead end at the property line, and on the other side of the property line, it connected up with a farm road that was on the Jordan property. And that it was done that way, one, because the subdivision ordinance requires that dead ends uh, to existing vacant land be laid out for a logical scheme of development if that occurs. Uh, the site walk for the Dominicus Crossing subdivision actually included walking by the pond uh, that we saw during the site walk on December 3rd. So there were several people that had observed connections between those areas. Joe, may I say something on that? Yes. Um, I, I grew up on that side of town on a piece of property that actually butts where Cross Hill was. And I biked around the, that property quite a bit. Uh, when I was younger, and this was the early 90s before Cross Hill even existed, before it was on any map or any application, and I can tell you that that road definitely existed. Uh, I would ride my mountain bike that is basically a Greenbelt Trail now, um, but it used to cross over to that property. When you got to the top of the hill, a larger road, I would suggest it was definitely wider than a trail, opened up and it was a hell of a ride down to uh, the pond at that time. Um, so I can speak from personal experience that that was definitely there before 2012 and definitely did not end at the uh, edge of the pond there. So I just want to put that out to the board. Okay, and then uh, there was a question about the Conservation Commission. Yes, so under the ordinance, anytime there's a resource protection permit, the Conservation Commission is given an opportunity to provide advice to the planning board. Um, they're not required to do that. And even if they do provide you with advice, you're not required to take their advice. If they had held a meeting uh, in December, th they would have looked at this application. The meeting was canceled due to bad weather. Okay. Um, that leaves co-location. John? Thank you. I'm the town attorney, John Wall, um, and I just wanted to um, reiterate uh, some points I, I already communicated with uh, with Maureen O'Meara. Um, I do think that the co-location provision of the ordinance is is in there to allow the town some measure of control over the number of towers that are erected, and that. The co-location provision does that in two ways. One, by requiring uh, persons erecting towers to uh, allow for co-location, including both mechanical and sort of legal means of making that happen. But also um, giving the board the discretion to uh, analyze the need for additional towers when those are requested. And so I think both of those provisions give the town some ability to have some control. And um, certainly with regard to any type of request, in my view, I think the town has the ability and this board has the discretion to review the, the need issues 
related to that. Okay, does the applicant wish to come forward and answer any of the questions that they heard? No, thank you. Okay. So I'm going to open this up to the discussion by the board. And before we start, it seems like there's a couple broad areas. One is the co-location question, which I think we should put to rest. And then two are more technical issues regarding the road and drainage and the uh, resource protection permit. Which would you like to do first? <laughs> co-location. <laughs> Get the hard one out of the way. All right. Total location. Okay, so who wants to start? Should I try to give it a try? Um, somebody did mention, came up, about height of a tower. That the prime location on the tower is the highest point. Um, technically, I haven't heard as to why, other than the fact that it would give the best coverage area. I haven't seen it proved, or I haven't seen it suggested by a software program of the different heights on the tower to what the coverage area would be. The last time I did see something about it, I asked about the program, and the program worked out, I guess, from the information put into it, its coverage area. But it didn't mention what height on a tower that coverage area would be. And so there, there's a, a leading question there about co-location is putting multiple things on a tower, but whether in actual fact it would have the coverage area, I'm unsure of at this present moment. It's a question that, that I can't answer. So I understand co-locating co somebody who's just, who, who can meet the requirements of particular area coverage but if they have to go up on a certain height, then it may not be possible to co-locate. So it might be necessary to have multiple towers in some areas to be able to cover that. That's my, my area. That's what I would like. Yeah. You so gonna, do you want to answer those questions straight away? Or do you oh, um, yeah. Uh, right, let's do that. If you allow us, we'll have our expert answer that question. Okay. Steve? Steve? Steve Kennedy, uh, 15512 West Coolidge Street, Goodyear, Arizona, 85395. I'm a consultant uh, hired by Crown to help with strategic relocation of towers. Um, the plot you have in front of you is a modeling software plot. Um, so this is what a theoretical model shows as coverage. You can see that the red area, that the solid red, is the existing coverage for the carrier for Verizon that's on the current tower. If you look at the hatched area, that's going to be the projected future coverage area for the new location. So the question about uh, the height, the design, um, 
I'll go back to it depends. And uh, nobody likes to hear that answer sometimes, but it's what it is. So uh, trying to make this uh, understandable, um, each network, each carrier, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, United States Cellular, have a different network. It's a different radio network. All the sites that provide the service within the Portland area, they're not all of the same sites at the same spot. Sometimes one guy's on a water tank. Let's take for an example, T-Mobile's on a water tank, but nobody else is on that water tank. Uh, down the road, T-Mobile has another site. And then AT&T may have a site in between those at a rooftop. The carrier's networks are not the same. They're not designed the same. They're not the same antennas. They're not the same equipment. They're not the same locations. Yes, there are shared locations where multiple wireless providers will be on the same structure, but at different heights. Reason for that is basically this is the best spot we can use. It's right across from the mall in South Portland. We need to be there, right? There's, there's lots of ca capacity and coverage, lots of calls being processed, lots of people running applications on their iPhones or their galaxies or whatever. So each network is different. Uh, to say that every carrier wants to be at the top, not all of the time. It depends upon the capacity of the area. Uh, in previous discussions we've had before, I talked about the amount of uh, capacity that a transmitter has. I refer to like your Wi-Fi access point at home. You know, the farther you get away from it, the slower your speed is. The more people that are on it, you know, if you have multiple children and they're all doing streaming or Xbox, things like that, it affects the capacity, the ability for that transmitter to process calls. The same thing happens with these networks. Uh, there's a lot of subscribers on each carrier, but they all act differently, right? They're, each subscriber is different as every one of us, right? So how each carrier, the amount of capacity they have to provide for a particular area is depending on how many subscribers they have in that area and what those subscribers use, how they use their phones, how they use their devices. Uh, so once again, I say it depends. It depends on how close the neighbors are for Verizon from this location. They aren't going to have always the exact same locations as every other carrier. It's a different network. So because they're different networks, allowances can be made sometimes where you can go at a lower height and it's still okay because the whole concept behind cellular coverage is multiple low power transmitters that overlap in coverage. One transmitter just doesn't stay and it broadcasts out like a, a TV station or a radio station. They usually have one broadcast transmitter that covers a large area which is fine, that's FM radio. But this is where subscribers get together and the more dense the amount of subscribers, the more calls being processed, the more capacity, the more coverage or cell splits have to be built to maintain that amount of service to those, those people in that area. So Verizon may have more subscribers in a particular area than Sprint, or Sprint may have more subscribers in a particular area than T-Mobile. They're all independent of each other. Yes, sir. So you, you're talking about stationary reception rather than moving from cell tower to cell tower. If you were mobile, you're going to be passed. Your conversation is going to be passed from tower to tower. Yes, sir. So, but you're talking about houses in this particular instance rather than mobile. It's, it's either way. Um, back in the early days, it was always about mobility and people making calls on interstates and driving around. As the devices have changed over time, uh, more people have, you know, their cellular phone is their primary phone line. They don't have home phones. So there's two ways to look at it. There's the mobility aspect of it, right? right. How, how are they moving in and out of those cells? How big of a coverage area is the, are those cells covering? And the amount of capacity. And there's also the stationary or the uh, height of amount of coverage that you actually need. This is a large area coverage site. All right? You go to downtown Portland, sites aren't going to cover this much area. They don't need to. They have to be smaller because right. they have to process more calls in a smaller area. So you need more transmitters with more capacity equipment to make those calls happen. But they don't need to be so high, I assume, for, yes, a, lower, for, a, smaller, for a smaller area. It, it all depends on what they're trying to serve. It depends on what's around the area. Is it suburban houses? Is it 
10 or 20 story buildings is a rural open field. But in Cape Elizabeth, the environment's not changing tremendously. I mean, other than, I mean, you've got stationary houses using it, a few mobile cars, I assume. So is there no, competi no the competitive nature of the height you're saying doesn't matter or it does matter? It does matter depending on what you're trying to cover. Verizon has different spots that surround this site in Cape Elizabeth. They may be closer to this site where um, there's more overlap or uh, they don't need the height that the other carrier does where Sprint may be spread out farther apart. It also comes down into the frequency band that the carriers are using. Sprint and T-Mobile use mostly high band equipment or mid band equipment which works in the 1.8, 1.9, 2 gig range. Uh, 2 gigahertz frequency range where uh, Verizon and, and United States Cellular or, or even uh, AT&T work down in the 700 and 850 megahertz range so the ability for that energy goes farther okay. than what it does at the higher or the mid-band frequencies so there's the, the frequency impact there's the coverage what does the site need to cover the amount of capacity in the area and even though it, it's a fixed site the capacity within that site is transitioning okay. all the time. Sure. I mean, it's a constant change. Sure. Uh, the flux in, in how these networks handle this traffic, it's constantly changing. Uh, you know, an airplane lands at an airport, what's the first thing everybody does? <laughs> yeah. They light up their phones. Well, don't you know what happens to that cell site covered in the airport? That thing gets hammered with all those people lighting up those phones. So the capacity can change just like that. Car accident, wreck police, whatever. The impacts are always constantly different. So as far as having a different height, does everybody want to be at the top? It depends upon the area of service and the amount of customers being served and what's the geography and topology of that area and how many customers are being provided for from that carrier. Does that answer your question, sir? Do we have any other questions on yeah. coverage? Um, I don't know if you know the answer. I know it was stated that your proposed tower is lower. I think the base, the grade is 110 feet. I don't remember what your existing one is. Um, the existing tower, I believe, if I remember correctly, is... Is what? Okay, so the, cha the change in terrain has an impact. Whenever I designed this original SAR train, I gave Crown, which that's what they asked me to do, is give them where we think this site, the, re the relocated site, the new site that will take the place of the old site needs to go. Right? This is a, we're going to take one tower down, we're going to put the other tower up. What's the best site location for this to go? One of the things I take into account is ground elevation. So when I run a propagation model, I review the surrounding terrain and say, okay, where are areas that are 20 feet below the existing ground elevation or AMSL and I, I remove those areas and say don't go into those areas because you're going to have to increase the tower height to make up for the change. Try to stay at the same ground elevation or higher. That's the generic thing. You know, you get up on a hill you can see everything. Right? If you're down in the valley you can't. The same concept with towers. But I always tell them go to at least the same elevation or a higher elevation. Does that make sense? Well, I just, the proposed one is 110 feet. Do you remember what your existing one is? Uh, I think one. The existing is 112. So a two feet difference. One foot difference. All right, all right. Essentially the same. Yeah, so it, it's a basic of trying to make sure that the terrain elevation is at least the same or higher, and that adjusts the tower height based upon what's going on in the area. Okay. No. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, in your experience as a consultant, do you see the uh, demand for wireless, <coughs> excuse me, uh, wireless tower space growing, flat, declining? What's uh, changing? Um, I see the demand increasing uh, every time I attend a zoning hearing. Um, hearing both sides, everybody has a phone. I, I would venture to say everybody in this room has a phone, and it's not a, it's a smartphone which relies heavily on apps. The carriers are constantly fighting the battle of trying to make sure capacity is there just in time to where they're not spending money too far ahead 
and they're not behind the eight ball where people are getting very poor service. So it's a constant battle. Depending upon the area, it can be more towers, it can be carrier overlays where they add more channels to existing structures, it can be small cells uh, where they're mounted on street lights and they ever only cover two or three blocks. It depends upon the environment. So is the demand getting greater? Yes, sir. The, the more apps we load on our phones, the more times that we're sitting on a bus or, you know, spouses on the phone while you're driving, the, the demand's not going to stop. We're becoming very reliant on these. So it will always be an increase. So it's always a, I won't say fight, that's not the term. It's a, it, it's a job to make sure that these networks can handle what's being thrown at them. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Okay. Any others? Okay, I have uh, a question. Um, what, uh, how many uh, antennas do you need committed to in order to go ahead and proceed with building the tower? And good evening. For the record, my name is Paul Peckins. I'm with Crown Castle. I'm based out of our Richmond, Virginia office. Uh, with this particular situation, I, ideally we would like to have all the carriers that have already committed coming over, uh, but we have made commitments to the fire department, the police department, as well as Verizon and T-Mobile. So ideally we're moving forward with all four of those. That currently is the game plan as well as we do have you know, conversations going on with AT&T. Uh, one of our national gentlemen that can kind of speak to that in a little bit better detail, but uh, the game plan is that we're moving forward. Ideally we would like to move forward with this opportunity and meet the demands of our customers. I have another question. Uh, along that same line, I guess you took the words out of my mouth, but from a business point of view, you're not going to put up a spec tower and if you build it, they will come. Before you put that up, you'll have some people in your pocket, some customers? In a, in a very general sense, yes, sir. There's, this site is going to be a very expensive site to, to build. Um, you know, with the road and everything associated with it. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so any other questions? I have no questions, but I can have my, we can have the discussion. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, all right. Open a discussion here. So, with regards to the co-location issue, because I think we're still discussing that, um, my view on the co-location is that this is, at this time, this application in particular is not quite a co-location. It's a relocation of a tower that is owned by Crown Castle that is on leased property for the Stroud property that is moving over to the Jordan property. Um, so it's a different situation than simply throwing these antennas onto a different tower. Um, there were some comments made by the public that they don't want to see increased towers. I see this as a, a one tower coming down and another tower going up. So it's a wash. Um, basically, this we've gotten information from the application uh, from the applicant that's been consistent throughout uh, from the first time they came for the proposal to have this property zoned as a tower overlay district um, that they were moving from that Stroud property that they had the carriers that are on the Crown Castle owned tower right now are Verizon AT, t AT t and T-Mobile and then the police and the rescue uh, antennas and that uh, we've heard just now that at least two of those carriers and then the police and rescue would be going with this tower to the new property. Um, so I see this as a wash and I see it as a, a need to, con to continue with cell phone coverage as you just see from this map um, that is necessary on that side of town and beyond. Um, so the idea that this is putting up more towers this application in particular is not putting up more towers. It consists of a tower coming down on one property and a tower being put up on another property. It's simply a relocation. Um, and just for the record, the last application that we've looked at, since I've been a member of this board, we've approved two cell phone towers. Um, 
one was actually not approving a cell phone tower, but it was allowing a carrier going on the water tower at Shore Acres, which um, somebody talked about tonight. Uh, that was actually out of necessity since the town lost a federal lawsuit in that. Um, so it came to the planning board for site plan review. One of the requests that was made of this board to Verizon at that time was a coverage map. That to me showed that we were requiring Verizon to demonstrate that there was a need for this tower to go up. Um, then after that, there was a technical amendment that was adopted by the town council that required coverage maps as part of the applications for the towers. And I think that demonstrates what we need to see when we are going to approve in a tower. And I think that this applicant has shown that in spades with particularly, they've been showing us Verizon and the other carriers of how that service is going to change from the one tower that's there now to the relocation of the other tower. So I'm satisfied um, that we aren't going to be putting up more towers. And in fact, uh, I'll get to my last point here, is with the other, pro with the other tower that was approved, one of those things was the condition of that is that there were four other towers on the Stroud property that was going to come down. So that means that this board is actually taking down towers rather than increasing the amount of towers. So I just want to point that out to the public. So I'm perfectly satisfied um, with regards to the issue of co-location with this applicant because I don't view this as putting up more towers. I view this as a relocation of the Crown Castle property uh, tower from one property to another. Victoria. Uh, just quickly, I do agree with everything Jonathan just said. Uh, when um, I hear the concern that um, we are putting up too many towers, there are too many towers, uh, I don't understand uh, how there are too many when you're taking one down from the Stroud property and putting it up on the Jordan property. I, I don't see where that is creating more towers, moving one to the other. And as Jonathan mentioned, this board did approve um, on the straw property taking down towers. I, I don't see that the board is moving forward to create more towers. We've actually taken some down and we're now discussing moving a tower. Um, so everything Jonathan said was more eloquent, but I just want to come in and say I do agree with that statement. We can't ignore that we've also approved another tower for Justin Stroud another 180 foot tower. I mean, you say we're taking one down and putting another one up. We can't ignore that we have approved one. That doesn't mean it's going to go up. But, 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 you do, do. but Jim, just out of respect for that, from the beginning, from when the Strouts and the Jordans put in applications, this board made an effort to treat them as two separate applications. And I think that's what we're doing right now. Peter? <coughs> yeah, the, um, I, I certainly understand the, the fear that the uh, gentleman from the telecommunications committee expressed way back when that Cape Elizabeth didn't want to see a, a forest of telecommunications towers sprouting up like weeds. <clears throat> I think in reality, though, the, the, the system the town has in place on its ordinances really meets that fairly. The, um, the, the first level of control is whether or not overlay districts will be authorized one was for this particular application, but the town council is not going to be authorizing willy-nilly around town uh, for anybody who wants it. It's looked at fairly carefully. Uh, furthermore, the co-location uh, is, is mandatory. You may not put up a tower unless you are allowing co-location by other users. Uh, there's also a provision where somebody can be denied a uh, permission to put up a tower if there is co-location space available elsewhere at the levels that they're seeking to put their antennas. So there are a number of things in place. And finally, the sort of the economic law of supply and demand. These are fairly expensive installations. And I, uh, I, I don't think there's a serious risk of people throwing up towers at the drop of a hat without customers to serve them. Uh, we know that the demand for uh, wireless space is growing. Uh, in leaps and bounds uh, for all types of communications and broadband uh, capabilities. And I, I think the, the, there's been a demonstrated need here for the Crown Castle Tower. I, I don't see a, a risk in what we're talking about in this application that goes to the uh, broader concerns of 
lots of unused tower space littering our landscape. That seems to me to be not a, a likely outcome. Henry? Uh, just as I see it, technically it would occur, it would seem that as you grow networks and as you expand the coverage of what they provide for the users, in other words, you need increased bandwidth all of the time, that you can't afford to have just one tower anywhere. In case that fails, you suddenly you've lost communication on the whole area. So you, in my estimation, you ought to have some form of backup capability and a technical requirement to be able to answer most of the conditions that might apply. So I don't see this as a, as a, um, a proliferation. I see it as an extension of an existing requirement. Um, I would agree very strongly with what Jonathan said. Uh, I would also add that uh, the reason Jim and I asked about the technical uh, financial feasibility of putting one of these towers up is that, um, you know, many of you said we don't need more than one tower. Well, we don't really know that right at the moment. We may need more. I mean, I think that if whoever gets their tower up first with um, their tenants, once that's up, if additional uh, carriers are needed, then it's probably to the town's benefit to have an additional tower. Um, so I think that this is a great place where the market will control the number of towers that go up. All right, so anything else on co-location? No, just besides the fact that just one thing that I think the applicant has demonstrated that they're going to allow co-location given the fact that they've uh, indicated that they've already gotten commitments from two carriers and then along with the police and fire and that there's no need or that they've indicated that uh, they need to provide different towers for each of those carriers at equal heights. I think that satisfies to me that they're committed to co-location on this one tower given the fact that they've already indicated that they're going to have four uh, tenants at this time. Okay, well let's move on then to the um, resource protection and road issues. Does anybody have any questions regarding that? Yes, one question. I think this is for the applicant. Um, the spillway that we saw on the sidewalk, I was just hoping you could address that. And, um, and actually, maybe Maureen first. Uh, that spillway, it's my understanding, was put in when Cross Hill was built. Uh, is that accurate? Or after? I know that there were design features that were included on that pond that were part of Cross Hill. Can you describe what the spillway is? For well, and I, I'm getting a little nervous because I'm getting into the engineering. So, um, and I know oh, that maybe we could have the applicant there. describe that. Maybe, yeah, oh, yeah. maybe the applicant could do that. I know at the <laughs> sidewalk, the, the, one of the owners of the property corrected me, and I don't want to misspeak again, but I know that there were features included in that road and that pond that were related to Cross Hill. Uh, for the record, Lucas Anthony Goral Palmer. Um, I can't speak to the history of the, the spillway. I don't, I don't really know that. But um, what I can tell you is that we don't really intend to change the function of that. Um, so can you just describe quickly what the spillway is? I'm not sure everybody understands what that is. It, the, the feature on the road, right? That's what we're discussing. It is, yeah. Essentially, the spillway is that portion of the road that cuts through the pond. Um, and there's, there's a couple features of that spillway that serve to drain the pond. Um, there's a control structure, which is on the, the pond side, that's connected to a pipe. And that serves as an overflow feature. Um, during rain events, precipitation, that the pond fills up, and water is able to discharge from that control structure. Um, secondarily, when, what we saw on the, pipe, uh, the site walk was that there's a sort of a low depressed area across the spillway. So that, that's an emergency overflow. Um, we're proposing to maintain that as, as part of our, uh, the road reconstruction. 
So there's really no, no changes occurring to this other than the width we're adding. Um, I think this is probably a good time, too, to address one of the comments we heard um, earlier from the public. There was some mention of a, a, a one, 1 in 10 slope, and um, I think there was some confusion on that. It wasn't a side slope. It wasn't a slope from the top of the road down to the pond. It was the slope that approaches the, the emergency overflow. Um, when we walked the, the site and walked the road, I think we all saw that. We, we stepped down a little bit partway across the, uh, the spillway, and then it came back up. So that 1 in 10 is actually the slope down to the depressed area, not, not the slope from the top of the road down to the pond. Okay, so yeah, my question is going to be on that. Do you see any problem with the reconstruction of the road at that point that's going to um, would be to interfere with any fire trucks or any emergency vehicles getting in there? No, we've, um, you know, we, the fire chief has weighed in. He stated that he's wanted it 14 feet wide with guardrail, and uh, that's how we've designed it on the current plans. Okay, thanks. So in a flood event, it's possible that the middle of the road there would have water on it, right? That's, yes. Do you, do you have some idea of the maximum depth that could it obtain? I don't. No, um, we haven't looked at that, and I don't know if maybe the Jordans have some uh, anecdotal history they could provide, since they're uh, they're pretty close to it. I don't know if that's worth worth noting. Um, well, I, I don't think there's going to be much water on that spillway because the whole design is that the water is going to go over to the right. that um, sort of drop off on the other side of the road. So. Question over here. <coughs> Pete? Yeah, uh, Chris? Oh. Quite, pardon me, a question while you're still up? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not able to answer some of the questions on the pond and the spillway. Sure. I don't have any more questions yeah. on the spillway. If you would like. Yeah. Okay. The, the spillway was originally built when, uh, with Cross Hill in mind. Uh, they, I guess the planning board must have requested it. The concern was that the culvert, I think we have a two foot culvert underneath the dam, and there was just a concern that if that culvert couldn't handle any water overflow from, you know, because there's more paved roads and everything, more water would come down through there, they wanted a place for it to go that they picked. So they built that, they requested to put that spillway there. I've never seen water over that spillway or even up close to it, but it's just an emergency type of thing. Okay. You know, Chris, can I ask you about the road, please? <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the sidewalk on the dam itself, um, we had the tape out for a, a 12 and a 14 foot measurement. And at, at 12 feet, you could see it happening at four, at 14 feet, you were getting very close to the, the drop off on either side. And is your engineering figured out how you're going to do that and have a sustainable slope? I guess you're talking engineering. I'm sorry, yes. talking to the gentleman behind you there. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, uh, when I heard you, you're going to do 14, I, I really I felt compelled to ask you to explain in a little more detail how you're going to handle that. Yeah, we are doing 14 feet wide. Um, and you're right, it does, it does go beyond the current width of the road. What that means we have to do is, is create side slopes that um, in some areas fill down into the water. Um, so what we've done is to comply with the, um, with the town's code, we've done a 14 foot wide road with side slopes no more than two to one. And um, in areas where they are two to one slope, we've uh, specified riprap for those, uh, for those slopes. Anything with a less of a slope than two to one doesn't require riprap, and um, so we we really tried to minimize the footprint of the road as it goes through the pond. And um, it, you're correct in that we are going to impact the pond in some places, which is really what necessitates um, DEP and Army Corps permitting that we talked about before. So you'll do some backfilling in the pond on one side, and the other side is coincides with the boundary to the south property. Is that correct? Can you avoid encroaching onto that? Yeah, 
same thing on the other side. We're also sloping down and um, we're avoiding the uh, going sloping into the neighboring property. So um, we have designed it that way. It does work all the way across the pond. So that shows up on your, I can't remember which plan it is, but there's blue colored in along the left-hand side of the road, and that's where you're dropping rocks into the water, basically. That's correct, yeah. We uh, submitted a wetland exhibit, wetland impact exhibit. Jim. On um, the spillway, how are you going to stabilize the, what are you going to use to stabilize the steep banks on each side? And what do you, and second, uh, second part of the question, what do you, are you going to lengthen the posts for the guardrails? How are you going to make sure they're going to be down deep enough to do any good? Uh, to stabilize the slopes on the, the pond, we'll be using riprap anywhere it's greater, or two to one slope. I just remember it a lot steeper than two to one, as I remember. Did I have my tape measure build, out? We do have to build it to two to one. We can't go any steeper than that. Um, so that's what we'll be doing. Elsewhere, it'll be um, stabilized with the uh, loam and seed. Okay. And if needed, erosion control blanket, it's, um, the contractor can... And how about so, the guardrails in? The guardrail, we've added a foot to the depth, and we've moved the, um, moved the guardrail out of the slope. So now the guardrail is actually within just a, a flat shelf area at the edge of the road. So it's no longer um, within the slopes. Your driving piles, you're not putting any concrete or anything, you're just going to drive them down in there? They'll be, um, they'll be embedded about seven feet, and um, I think typically they'll auger that hole down and then put the post in and fill around it with um, some good backfill material, gravel, or um, I, can, I think our detail shows gravel. Okay. And that's in your revised detail subsequent to what you've submitted to us? Yes. Okay. Jim? I know one of the comments from the town engineer were the occasional, I can't remember the exact term, the, the conduits um, under the reconstructed road. Uh, this was a general note put where needed. I'm trying to remember the exact, you know what I'm talking about, uh, sort of the as the stormwater comes down, it's got a, you know, a way to go under the road to the yeah. pond. Yeah, so um, really uh, the engineer was concerned with the, um, the area from the tower where the tower is going to sit down to the road. Mm -hmm. um, it's got quite a steep slope, if you remember from the, right. the site walk. Um, so what we've done to address that is we've put a ditch at the bottom of the, the road mm -hmm. so that as water runs off that hill, it collects into the ditch. It'll flow down through the ditch and then into a culvert under the road. Just one? one. Uh, actually, I've got culverts in two places. Okay. I just don't remember that. Okay. Yep. And that uh, drawing, that's also on subsequent drawings? It is, yes. Okay. Pete? Okay. Yeah, the, uh, I was struck by the, the uh, letter from Sebago Technics, um, and it, was, it went on some length of details and, and the... Uh, drainage and the conservation efforts that show up in your plans and they had sometimes questions, sometimes critical comments and it was a fairly long list and I, I took you to say a few minutes earlier that you've met with them, you've been through their letter and you've satisfied them on each and every point, is that correct? We met with the, we met with Sebago Technics this morning. We walked through each and every comment. Um, we showed them our revised plans and, and the way that we, uh, we would address each comment. Um, based on that discussion, our opinion is that, um, that we've satisfied all the comments from the town engineer. I think they have to, uh, the town engineer does have to submit a formal response. So I can't really speak to that, but it was my opinion from that meeting that we were able to satisfy him um, in all his comments. Yeah, that's where I'm going, I guess. We'll be looking for a letter from Sebago saying that, that you have met their concerns and comments. Maureen, have you spoken with Steve Harding today? Yeah, Steve, I mean, we're, we're, Steve has done a great job in responding um, very, very quickly. Uh, he got the plans, mon uh, I think it was last Monday. He got a letter to me that you have in your package by the end of day Wednesday um, and then met again with the applicant today. Um, he did not have time to put more in writing. Uh, his comments to me were that generally 
he's satisfied that his issues can be addressed, but he needs to see the plans. The revised plan from the last submission on yes, the he will. He will. The applicant really does need to take the most current plans and make revisions to address all of the comments that are in his letter. Um, my understanding is the meeting today gave him some confidence that there was a way to address all of those concerns. Um, the question for the board is: Do you, do you want to? push that all on to Steve now, or do you want to have Steve review a further submission from the applicant and report back to you? I guess my thinking right now is to look at a revised set of plans before I'm ready to move forward with um, the application. That's my feeling right now. Is there anybody else? Victoria? Um, I would say our standard procedure is to put a condition of approval that you will meet and abide by the, anything that the um, town engineer or a town planner or, you know, if there's any requests. So I, I'm tending to fall back on what we've, we've done in the past is it, it won't go any further. You are correct. You are correct. Except I would, it seems like there's a lot of items here. And at some point, there's too many. And I'm not, I feel a little, and I agree with Jim, I feel a little uncomfortable going forward without having all these issues addressed and getting the letter from the engineer and taking a look at it. Yeah, I, I share Jim's view. So these are basically fairly important environmental concerns. <clears throat> I have no doubt that they can meet them, but I, I, I think we probably should. I mean, you get to a point is, are we delegating authority to the town right. engineer, which we don't want to do. So my instinct would be to uh, have them resubmit amended plans and, and get the reply from Sebago. Anybody else? Well, I, I'm sort of in an awkward situation, Nathan. Sorry, because it's my last uh, time to be sitting on this board, so I'd like to pass it to somebody else, but I, I, I feel that... Uh, you should have all of the things straight before you sign it off. All right, well, are there any other items uh, pertinent, Victoria? Um, just one question. Um, someone in, um, stepped up in the, during the public hearing. They said this application um, is greater than 180 feet tall with the antenna. Would you like to make a comment on the height of this tower with the antenna? I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that. Well, whoever would be. This tower will meet our ordinance. Correct. The tower itself is 180 feet. It's just that the fire department, the police department, with their style of antennas, those will actually stick up above that. So 180 feet of tower steel. Okay. And our provisions say towers including antennas would be 180. Can I? Yeah, I'm yeah. worrying. This is a, an ongoing discussion in the Code Enforcement Office, and I'd like to suggest that none of these antennas can get put on the tower without getting a permit, a building permit from the Code Enforcement Officer. This is an opportunity for us to the Code Enforcement Officer to make that interpretation. Okay, that's fine with me. All right, would anybody like to make a motion? I just have, I didn't know, and the board may not want to deal with it at this time, but under the Shoreland Zoning Standards, um, the memo from me talked about whether you wanted to treat this as um, its improvements to an existing farm road, which can be considered under subsection 2, which regulates existing public roads, 
or do you want to consider it under subsection 3, which regulates new roads where you could be granting an exception? Is the board interested right now in trying to give the applicant some direction on which way you want to go with that? You could alternately ask the applicant to include in their next submission a proposal for how they want that to be treated. Does anybody have a feeling one way or the other? I mean, when I looked at that, I thought, I've been thinking of it as an existing road for a long time. It's hard for... That's all I have? Okay. Yeah, I, I, my exposure in the flight walk certainly said it was a, it's an old road. Yeah. But, you know, there is grass growing between the tire marks, sure. But it's, uh, I took it to be an old farm road, uh, logging road, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Well, definitely a road. So that'd be the first, the first one? Uh, That's subsection two. Thirteen. Okay. All right. Now, uh, would you like to make a motion? Well, let's see where this goes. Motion to table. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of global acquisitions for LLC for site plan review, a resource protection permit and shoreland zoning review to construct a 180-foot tall telecommute telecommunications tower to be located at 19 Wells Road be tabled to the regular January 16th, 2018 meeting of the Planning Board. I have a second? Second. Pete, all in favor? Uh, I'm sorry, any no. discussion? Okay, all in favor? Opposed? Passes. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the town attorney so you can go home? Thanks for coming. the agenda so those of you who are exiting please do so quietly next item on the agenda is where private road private access way permit Peter Ware is requesting a private access way permit to create frontage and access for a lot located at the rear of 69 Beach Bluff Terrace, section 19-7-9, private access way, public hearing. We'll start with uh, Dustin doing a quick presentation of the application. Thank you and good evening. Uh, my name is Dustin Roma, civil engineer, uh, working on the project. And um, uh, we've had a, a site walk um, on this project. And uh, just to kind of recap, if there's anybody, oh, there's nobody here from the public, but uh, <laughs> some of the uh, some of the items that we really focused on are, are looking at the access point where Beach Bluff Terrace um, provides access to the private access way. Um, we uh, looked at a number of the large trees that were existing along the property line and 
um, making sure that we could avoid those with the uh, with the new roadway construction. Um, also looked at the uh, the Hammerhead location and then uh, made our way down to the stream um, to take a look at some of the um, the buffers that are there and the adequacy of the existing vegetation and, and the material you wanted to leave there um, to establish that uh, building window. Um, so the plans that we've resubmitted, uh, we did uh, delineate the, uh, the edge of what we are proposing as the building envelope for this project, which includes both the access way and the land that we feel is uh, suitable to construct the dwelling. Uh, the leach field, the driveway, and the foundation drain uh, for the structure. Um, also taking into account uh, limits of grading around the building to, to tie into existing grade uh, so that we can maintain all the uh, appropriate buffers to the, uh, to the various uh, wetlands and streams on the property. Um, a couple of the items that are um, um, that were brought up in the review memo from uh, Sebago Technics uh, had to do with the, um, the leach field that we're proposing at the end of the roadway and the uh, proximity of the turnaround to that. Um, we, uh, the, the grading that we had shown on the, on the plan that we had submitted to you uh, didn't quite account for the amount of uh, material that needed to be on top of that leach field, uh, but the, the plan that I have in front of you here tonight and this one here, we have um, added some spot grades at the end of the roadway. There was um, plenty of um, uh, elevation there for us to just adjust those grades on the uh, turnaround to provide enough room so that we do have the 12 inches of sand on top of the uh, H20 low graded concrete chambers and the full gravel section of the roadway um, on top of it. Okay, so you're not going to put it at the end of Beach Bluff, you're going to keep it where you show it then? Um, yeah, as far as the hammerhead goes, what we're doing is we're showing you how we can build it in that location and making sure that we've addressed all those items and there's nothing restricting us from building it in that location. If the town decides that they do, uh, they do gain the right title and interest to extend the road, then we would um, work with the town to build the turnaround uh, at the end of Beach Bluff Terrace instead of where we're showing it. So we're, we're maintaining all flexibility there and just making sure we're okay. designing the site appropriately. Um, we had to make we made some adjustments to the utilities based on the, the leach field location just to make sure we're uh, providing all the uh, adequate separation there. Um, we've also shown um, a line of rocks along the uh, edge of the buffer area just to provide some permanent uh, monumentation of where we're agreeing the, the edge of the window is. Um, there was a, a comment in there about um, potentially located in those rocks on the edge of the wetlands. Again, we're fine either way. We've shown them on the edge of the clearing limits to establish that, but um, if, if the goal is to put them on the edge of the wetlands, we're, we're happy to do that. Um, Can I just ask you, I didn't understand that point. Where the, the, the rocks are defining the 40-foot setback, right? Correct. From so the we're, stream. And yeah, right where's the wetland? Yeah, I mean, we're providing some buffer to the wetland here and some additional buffer here. So we showed the rocks to be at the edge of what we're agreeing is the building envelope so that we would maintain a buffer behind the rocks. So if I could... Well, it's not exactly if, the if, building envelope. Well, that's, yeah, if I could go right ahead. Uh, the reason we put the rocks in, it's not to mark where people can build a house. It's where they should stop mowing the grass. Right, and I think he's indicating they want the grass. I, I think that's actually nice to have the grass mowing in where they're showing the rocks. Uh -huh. But my guess is that the DEP restriction will allow people to mow. I mean, it's it's okay. it is up to the board, but you know the the rocks were supposed to be the the absolute edge of the no go zone. And please correct me if I'm wrong, Dustin, but. I believe that the DEP would allow people to landscape the area as long as they didn't put a building in it. Um, yeah, well, the permit by rule that we submitted was to basically um, only disturb up to where we're showing the rocks. So, there, so you would have to leave the rest of the vegetation natural? Yeah, beyond yeah, that. Yeah, then that would be the right place for it then. Okay. Yeah. The permit by rule was it's a no disturbance, okay. thing. Like soil disturbance is what they're referring to. So I, I withdraw my suggestion that the rocks be relocated. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 
Um, and then the other, um, the other uh, question that they asked us to address was to review the uh, turning templates for a WB40 vehicle just to make sure that the ladder truck can make it into the site. And um, there was a very subtle change um, to the radius here. We had a 20 foot radius coming in. What we've done is we've just done a very slight taper. It's a 10 degree taper right here uh, going into that 20 foot radius. So it's, um, it's, you don't really see it on the plan, but it is important that does track the vehicle movement as it comes in and turns into the site uh, where we do have kind of two narrower driveways that are not the typical 24 foot width. Um, so that was certainly a um, good pickup by the peer review engineer to have us check that. And it, it did again make a subtle change, which probably you know helps uh, in the long run. So we do have that diagram all pulled together um, and we it's, it's shown on this plane here that's in front of you here tonight. Um, there were um, a few items that were identified that are that are likely to be kind of post-approval items that we would address. One of those being the, the physical deed transfer of a portion of the Thompson's uh, Road right-of-way from one lot to the other. Um, that would likely happen, you know, post-approval to as a condition that that be the portion of land be transferred. Um, also, the roadway maintenance agreement being signed, executed, and recorded. Um, we would certainly agree to do that um, as a condition of approval and that way we could reference this plan and everything and, and make it really uh, uh, clear. Um, and then also just um, providing a stamp boundary survey which reflects these conveyances that are going to take place uh, from one lot to the other for the ownership of uh, Thompson Road and also um, just for the permanent dedication of the 30-foot uh, easement to the back land and the uh, potential um, easements that would be granted to the town if they were to um, execute this turnaround area. So where some of these things are on, ongoing, we're happy to just put the, um, you know, the, we could put that information on the plan as far as um, the limits of those easements. We have shown kind of a, an easement area on there, but it, it's really, we're just going to continue to cooperate with the town, whatever they need for easements. Um, in that turnaround area, um, within that 30 foot right away, we can certainly accommodate. Um, so I believe with that, that's what I had for um, additional information in response to the uh, comments that we received. So um, happy to answer questions. Just for formality's sake, I'm going to open this up for public hearing, um, seeing that there is no one here other than the applicant and his uh, engineer. Um, I'm going to close the public hearing and open it up to the board for um, their questions, or more questions, since we already started questions. Go ahead. Um, were the size of the boulders actually indicated anywhere in your plans? Just so that we have you know, kind of an agreement on size. Um, we haven't. I mean, I think they're actually shown a little larger than we intended on the plan, just to really call, call attention to them. Yeah. Um, they're perfect egg shapes, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like the they're easy to just put smooth. together. The big footballs. <laughs> yeah. um, Would you? Yeah, I mean, we, we can agree. I mean, if it's uh, you know two foot rock or a three foot rock or whatever you feel is appropriate. We've gone with three feet in the past. Is that? Yep. Note on the plan, just yeah, okay. yeah. Rocks are minimum three foot diameter. Okay. You can get those. I mean, that's not a problem getting them that size. No. And my second question is, um, I just want to make sure I'm interpreting this correct. More for you, Maureen. Um, so, is this correct that um, the maximum building footprint, twenty percent? Is that the maximum building footprint should be twenty percent? Or is that in my building coverage? Which, which, which number are you looking at? I am looking at general note number I think 10. That's in permanent. I, I just want to make sure if, if I'm reading that correctly. Is there a maximum building footprint of 20% or is it none? Yeah, in the, in the non conforming provisions, and let's remember this is what we would call a legal non conforming law because it's in the residency district. The minimum lot size in the residence A district is 80,000 square feet, and this lot is, what is it, 16,000 if I remember correctly? So it would fall under the non conforming provisions, and in the RA district, if you have a lot that's less than 80,000 square feet, you are subject to a maximum building coverage 
of 20%. Is that noted anywhere, that actual number that um, the building footprint will stay at 20%? I didn't see any numbers. Yeah, well, we were careful to, to show the building as a potential building because we weren't, we, that's not necessarily exactly what the building's about. Right, I know the siting always gets changed, but usually there might be a note saying it's so many square feet. Maureen, is that something that uh, Ben McDougall would pick up on? Yeah, we, we actually strongly discourage applicants from giving us the actual building footprint at this stage because it always changes. The people who are proposing it often are not the people who are going to actually be building the home, and even if they are, once they get ready to build it, they change the footprint. So what we say is you have to build inside the building envelope, and then, as uh, Jim mentioned, uh, Ben is going to make sure, because this is a non-conforming lot, it's going to have to comply with Article 4, the non-conforming provisions, and I feel confident that he will make sure that the building does not cover more than 20% of the law. Thank you. Go ahead. I have a question. Is it possible to build a duplex on this? No, because um, again you need 80,000 square feet per dwelling unit okay. and but you could potentially create an accessory dwelling unit in there if you make it work. All right, And then um, one of the notes is regarding the building envelope. It's not really clearly labeled where, what you have for building envelope there. Yeah, I mean, we can, I, I basically got it kind of just labeled a couple different places. Yeah, we need a lot, like a dash line. Yeah, that, that yeah this we, can, is the building we can hold envelope. it up. We can make it darker. I mean, it's just a dash line that goes all the way around, but we can certainly make it darker. It's fairly evident there. I mean, it, is, it is a dash bold lawn. We, we did attempt to make that. To, to the board, I, I get chewed by the code officer all the time if I don't make sure this is really clear on the plans and I'm learning. So if it could just be bigger and bolder and labeled. Thank you. You have an envelope of site disturbance. But I don't see anything labeled building envelope. <laughs> Excuse me, Jim, Peter. Yeah, and it might be just the way we, uh, I labeled it envelope of site disturbance. Right. Because building envelope sometimes gets tricky because I just want to. But you're not going to, your building envelope's not going to go right to those rocks. Right, that's why we called it the envelope of site disturbance because saying that that's the edge of that we would be disturbing right. any of existing ground. We need to see the building envelope, right? Am I right? Yes. Okay. That's what I heard. So. Yeah, and I'm sure we can work with Maureen and get yes. that on the plan. I think, do, is there a question over here, gentlemen? No, we're talking about the building envelope, too. So I, <laughs> see, um, <laughs> we're making sure you've got it all right. <laughs> One last I, I feel like I'm back in teaching again. <laughs> Go ahead. We felt uh, like we were students. <laughs> I, I might have read somewhere in Maureen's memo that um, a note should be added to the plan prohibiting structures outside the building envelope with the exception for sheds not exceeding 100 square feet in size. Would that be something that you'd be okay with? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we've read all of the proposed uh, conditions in the finding and we're agreeable to all of them. Okay. I'm not sure if that made it into the conditions of approval. So I'll be making some friendly amendment or something in case somebody on their last meeting wants to read this. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> No, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't have any fun with well, I do ha I have a question. Uh, general note number 19. It says the driveway location and the structure pr footprint are approximate and may be altered with the approval of the code enforcement officer. I don't have a problem with the structure footprint. And, but the driveway location, I don't know how that could be altered from where you're showing it. Um, I, what I meant is, is I refer to small alterations. For instance, if the building were to be flipped and the driveway were to come in on this side or something, rather than right here, if this were to be mirror, then there may be a small change to this. So it wouldn't change the access way okay. portion of the, of the frontage, but it would just change the driveway. Okay. 
Maury. It's really, um, it's really important to leave the driveway exactly where you have designed it until you get past the area where the turnaround is. Correct. So if you need to make changes, <laughs> it's possible you might have to come back for an amendment. This portion of the driveway, essentially. Yes. So until you get past the turn point, um, it's really what this whole application covers. And I just mentioned that to the board because I know you have someone coming back in proposing to make some changes to a private access way driveway. And you know that's the whole point of this review. So it really can't be changed. Okay. And I have one other question. Go ahead. Um, is it possible, is this really the only spot that the septic can go? I mean, is it possible to put it down in the um, bottom right hand corner somehow of this? Are you referring to this area? Yeah. We looked at this. Uh, it presents a couple of different uh, difficulties. The proximity to the stream. Uh, we yeah. do have setbacks for septic systems from uh, or resource features such as streams. Uh, it also was presenting uh, what was perhaps even more difficulty with regard to grading where it might access the garage at the, the elevation of the front of the garage door that was not going to be as effective in the area of the proposed terminal. The grading in the front of the garage was likely to be more effective by the presence of a leach bed at that location. And frankly, as a septic designer. Well, was, why do you have the garage there? See, I think that house should be flipped. And then, well, you, we don't yeah. know what the house is going to look like. I, I mean, in, in just in general terms, you're closing off your whole south end with the garage and, I don't know, porch or something. And, like, that's where you want the house open and all the light coming in. You could park on the west side of the house there. Joe, it's 10 05. So that's all I can say. This 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 face of the house is facing directly at the back of yeah. the other house. You have to plant some I don't think necessarily it, this this the orientation of this house I, is I would more attention to Robinson Woods, I believe, rather I than draw. Could you could you uh, just for the secretary identify yourself? I'm sorry, I'm Jim Logan, I'm with Longview Partners. I'm the septic system designer and the wetland scientist for Peter Weir on this project. Thank you. I assume I've got an error here. I just want to, on page one of the memo, uh, B access, B2 access driveway is proposed with an 18 inch deep gravel subbase, I assume? 18 inch. Did I put something else? 18 foot wide. Yeah, that's wrong. Okay. <laughs> Are there any other questions? So I guess I'll go back to mine. Are we going to change note 19 so that we don't include the driveway into something the code enforcement officer has? Just the, well, the structure footprint makes sense. I don't think you want the structure. It's a site okay. plan. Okay. It shouldn't be structural. Okay. So it should be do a we, building envelope. Do we, it, it says potential structure on the plan. Yeah. So you don't, I don't think you need that note. Okay. Note 19, we can remove it? Yep, we're agreeable okay. to that. Thank you. Because Ben would send you back here anyway, even if there was Note 19 on here. Yeah. <laughs> so anything else? We gonna, what, right. what action are we gonna take here? I think Victoria's been taking notes. <laughs> For um, a motion? Henry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Henry, did you, would you like to make the final on your final I meeting? Am, I, I, I'm incapable of thinking at the moment. I'm so yes. tired. My yes. Yes. I no. prefer you to do it. I'll second it. Yeah, actually, yeah. Oh, okay. Henry should <laughs> choose who has to do the motion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a question. Um, do I actually put a motion to remove note 19? As a condition? I would suggest that you add a condition that says that note 19 be deleted on sheet S1. Is it S2? S1. 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 
All right, then I will make a motion for Thank approval. Thank you. Okay. Motion for the board to consider. Finding of facts, Peter Ware is requesting a private access way permit to create access for a lot located at the rear of 69 Beach Bluff Terrace, which requires review for compliance with section 19-7-9 private access ways. Number two, the planning board conducted a site visit on Wednesday, November 29, 2017 at 7.30 p.m., attended by a majority of the planning board and representatives of the applicant. Number three, the town requires a turnaround for emergency vehicles and establishing a turnaround at the end of Beach Bluff Terrace may be a better option for public safety needs. Number four, parcel B will include the full 25 foot width of the Thompson Road Paper Street vacated by the town. Number five, public safety and protection of property is enhanced when wetlands are not altered and their absorptive capacity is preserved by maintaining their natural vegetation. Number six, clear delineation and labeling of the building envelope is needed for future construction protection of wetlands. Number seven, the application substantially complies with section 19-7-9 private access ways. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Peter Weir for a private access way permit to create access for a lot located at the rear of 69 Beach Bluff Terrace be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated December 13, 2017. Number two, that the boundary of the building envelope be clearly marked and labeled. Number three, that a road maintenance agreement be provided in form acceptable to the town attorney signed by the applicant and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. And before that, a transfer of the conveying from parcel A to parcel B, the entire width of the vacated Thompson Road be provided in a form acceptable to the town attorney signed by the applicant and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Number five, that rights of access for parcel B over parcel A be created in a form acceptable to the town attorney signed by the applicant and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Number six, that the applicant may eliminate the proposed turnaround located on parcel B if the town obtains permission to create a turnaround at the end of Beach Bluff Terrace. If the applicant elects to eliminate the parcel B turnaround, a turnaround easement of sufficient size to accommodate a WB40 class vehicle shall be provided to the town by the owner of parcel A. Number seven, that no building permit for parcel B be issued until the subsurface wastewater system design has been approved by the code enforcement officer. Number eight, that there be no issuance of building permit nor alteration of the site until the plans have been revised to satisfy the above conditions uh, have been submitted to the town planner and the plan has been signed by the planning board and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Number nine, uh, note 19 from sheet S1 be deleted. And number 10, a note be added to the plan prohibiting structures outside the building envelope with the exception uh, of four sheds not exceeding 100 square feet in size. And um, also number 11, that the uh, boulders that will be placed um, on the plan be uh, three feet in size. Okay. Make, may I make a friendly amendment? Second. Second. Wait, no. Oh, oh, we, can, we can then make friendly amendments okay. about it. And I think that's actually the proper pro procedure for it, is to I have apologize. a seconded motion. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Henry no. seconded. And may I make a friendly amendment? Uh, just on findings of fact, on uh, number two, um, it says, seven, I think you said 7.30 p.m. It was actually 7.30 a.m. Yeah, I saw that too. It would be dark. So, somebody wasn't, wasn't there, so she doesn't I wasn't remember. There. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Is that it? Was, was that, that the one everybody caught? <laughs> Except that for Maureen. I just wanted to ask if the condition number eight be the last condition number. I accept that friendly amendment. And so does Henry. Accept that friendly amendment. All right. I saw him nod. Yes. <laughs> All right. Anything else? All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Appreciate Thank it. you. All right. I'm going to open up for a public public comment on items not on the agenda. Uh, <laughs> Seeing none. I Seeing none. I have a public comment. No, I have a comment that's not on the agenda. Tonight is Henry's last meeting, and I would like to thank him for his time on the board and 
his entertainment and us learning how to speak British. And, I, uh, and if you don't mind, I'd like to say one thing. Or just something. I thoroughly enjoyed my time on it, but I'm incredibly impressed by the people that I worked with. I didn't believe when I first ventured onto this uh, adventure that I would meet such people so dedicated and so in tune with all the details that, that it required. I'm, I'm extremely impressed and on a final note I'd like to thank Maureen because I think that she's been one of the most interesting individuals I've ever met, dedicated to this town and I have had experience in other towns around this area and it don't hold a candle to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your winter in Arizona. <laughs> yeah. They got like 45, 55, and 65 degrees sunny watts, my wife's telling me. She's very up and down. All right, we need another motion. Sorry. Move to adjourn. Do I have a say? Okay, all those in favor? Great. All right, we're adjourned. I have a plan.